there is a deep desire to build something to attract God's presence. That's the idea. The third temple. For years now, there's been talk and desire to build and establish the third temple in Jerusalem. And from time to time, you will see news articles about the third temple preparation being in full swing and this great desire to rebuild the third temple. Why is it referred to as the third temple? Of course, the first temple was Solomon's temple, destroyed by Babylon. Then the second temple of Zerubbabel, destroyed by Rome. And since that time, there has not been a temple in Jerusalem. And for generations, there has been this desire and longing to rebuild the temple, the third temple in Jerusalem. And like I said, from time to time, you'll see it in the news. The architect and activist who wants who want to build Jerusalem's third temple. The idea is to restore the worship of God according to the Old Testament. And the purpose is to have a temple that God can inhabit. That's the idea. That God's presence can fill. Now I want you to keep this key point in mind. There is a deep desire to build something to attract God's presence. That's the idea. Keep that in mind as we go through our study today. In the scriptures, you find that there are a number of layers of truth. There are many layers. There are different patterns. And as you dig deeper in the Bible, you begin to discover different layers where the truth is not just simply lying on the surface. Today, we will look at a unique pattern of truth. A pattern of truth that is quite outstanding. And hopefully we'll see that together as we go along. Now these patterns of truth, these layers, these uh, gems of truth that are hidden and scattered and embedded in the scriptures, their purpose is to serve as the basis for the application and the experience in our lives. Now, I want to look at this because that's really the purpose of study. That's the purpose of sharing messages. That's the purpose of delving into the scriptures. It's to understand the truth so that we can exercise a more intelligent faith. That's the point. Faith that is based on understanding correctly the word of God. That's after all what the Bible tells us. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, how you understand the Word of God will directly impact your faith. That's what you believe. And consequently, what you believe will shape your experience in spiritual things. That is why it is vital to have an informed, intelligent, biblical faith. If I was to ask you a question, how many of you want to have a deeper experience in the things of God? Every hand will go up. The fact that you are here today indicates that. How do we have a deeper experience in the things of God? It's not just about having more faith. It's about having more faith that is intelligent, that is based on a correct understanding of God's word. You see, belief only, faith only, simply is not enough. There's a lot of belief out there in the world. People believe all kinds of things very sincerely. No, we must make sure that we have biblical faith. And you get that, and that grows, and that strengthens as you dig deeper in the Bible. So that's what we're going to do today. That's our purpose to go through these layers in the scriptures and see what we can learn and discover so that we can have a better and more informed faith and therefore a deeper experience in the things of God. Today we will look at three pictures in the Bible. God has communicated His desire and His purpose and will to mankind in different ways and means. One outstanding 
way is through types and shadows. This is God's desire. This is God's purpose revealed for mankind. One of the greatest and most detailed types that we see in the Bible was the system that is known as the sanctuary, right? The sanctuary system, so many details, so many different things, a priesthood, sacrifices, all these things that revolved around the sanctuary system, services, feasts, and plenty of details. And these reveal God's purpose and God's desire. I want to focus specifically on the overriding idea and plan that God had in mind in giving this particular type. We're familiar with this verse. It's in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. And he says here to Moses, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's the idea. That's the purpose. That's God's desire. The whole purpose of the sanctuary system, with all its services, with all its details, with all the priesthood, the sacrifices, was to accomplish this one particular thing. What is it? That God would dwell with His people. Now we're going to see that this is a significant point, not just in this picture, this is the first picture we're looking at, but we'll see that this is a significant point that emerges as we delve into the different pictures or layers that we find in the Bible. You know it's important in the Bible when it's recurring. When things are repeated in the scriptures, you know God wants us to pay attention to them. A recurring theme is of significance. Now, of course, this was a type, and by type we mean an illustration, of a greater reality that was to come in the future. That's what a type is. Now, here's the point of the study. I want, to, I want to share with you the point of the study at the beginning so that we can keep it in mind as we go along because we will see that it's a recurring point. I'm not going to save my point to the end. I'm going to bring it right up at the beginning. Here is the point. God's presence in the sanctuary was something greater than the contents of the sanctuary. And that is how God desired to dwell with His people. Now, I hope you caught that. Okay, that's an important point. I, I want you to really not miss it. I want you to keep it in mind because, like I said, it is recurring. It appears time and again in these three pictures that we will examine today. What were the contents of the sanctuary? If you remember, there were plenty of furniture items given and made uh, with great detail that God gave to Moses. All the different items of furniture in the holy place, in the most holy place, the curtains, all the different elements involved there. There were images and uh, carvings of angels. There was also the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant. And the most holy place would naturally be also the most important place. Isn't that right? And in there, you found... Not just the Ark of the Covenant, but the Book of the Law in a little special pocket right there uh, by the Ark. And the Book of the Law, of course, contained all the words that God had given to Moses, that Moses wrote down. Not only that, but also you found in the Ark of the Covenant, the very Law of God, written by God's own finger. The words that God spoke from Mount Sinai and that he wrote with his finger was housed in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place in the sanctuary. Yet, all these items did not constitute God's presence. I want you to think about that. Pictures are important in the Bible. Why am I saying that? Because you see that time and again, God manifested His presence and His glory in the sanctuary in a very visible manner. He pre uh, represented His uh, presence in a, a pillar of smoke. Glory, light, a pillar of cloud. That glory was known as the Shekinah glory, of course. A pillar of fire, as we see here in the image. These were visible tokens of God's glory and presence 
in the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, if you remember, there were some times that God's glory would fill the tabernacle and later the temple so much that the priests would not be able to go in and minister. You remember that? The presence of God in a very visible manner in the sanctuary. And all the while, the permanent items and contents of the tabernacle were the same. These things did not constitute God's presence. Can you see the point? Can anyone see the point? Is anyone out there? This side, can you see the point? What about this side here? Sounds like this side might see it a little better. Can you see the distinction? It's a picture, it's a clear picture, and it's quite obvious when you look at it from this perspective. So I'll say what I said again, the point is, God's presence was an addition to what was already there as far as the items. His glory and His presence. So that's it, that's our message, that's our study. Sermon finished for the day. You got the point this side? You got the point that side? Mission accomplished. But like I said, there are three pictures. This is just the first one. Today, there is a teaching, a false teaching. A teaching that confuses God's Word with His presence. And when I say God's Word, that includes God's written Word and God's spoken Word. For example, the Ten Commandments were both God's Word that He spoke from Mount Sinai and God's Word, the same words that He wrote with, a fi with His finger that were placed inside the most holy place in the sanctuary. But these words, the Word of God right there, were not the presence and glory of God that was manifested on top of the Ark of the Covenant in a very visible token. There was light, there was glory. You see the distinction. Today, this error, this confusion of mingling or mixing up God's Word with God's presence, equating the two, it doesn't actually fit the picture that we're seeing in the sanctuary. It's contrary to the picture. That's why I want us to keep this point in mind. That's why I started with the point at the very beginning. God repeats this lesson time and again in many different ways, like I said. Now, when we look at uh, types, when we look at illustrations in the Bible, a type was a symbol of a greater reality that was to come, which means that the type had certain limitations, certain restrictions. It wasn't the full reality, it wasn't the full picture of what God intended. For example, limitations of that type were people were not permitted to enter the temple where God's presence was. Only the priests were permitted to enter there. And the priests would only enter into the holy place only once a year were they permitted to enter into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. God's presence and God's dwelling was in one location where the sanctuary was set up. What is all that? All these are limitations. All these indicate that this system was simply a shadow pointing forward to a greater reality that would come. That's exactly what the scripture tells us, Hebrews 10.1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Sacrifices and blood were needed to deal with the sin problem, but these were simply symbols. They could not really cleanse from sin. They pointed forward to a greater reality. That's why it says here, the, the system of the law contained a shadow, not the reality, a shadow of the good things that would come. That is the reality that it pointed forward to. Of course, sin was the barrier that prevented God's presence from being with His people. That's why the sanctuary was designed to deal with the sin problem so that God may dwell with His people or among His people. It's very clear that the shadow is not the reality. And when the Bible here talks about the law, it's talking about the entire system that 
surrounded the sanctuary, the entire old covenant system, the sanctuary, the services, the priesthood, all the different instructions and things that make up the law. It only contains a shadow and not the reality. And now this is an important point to keep in mind. The reality is always greater than the shadow or the type. That's why we're looking at some limitations of the type. The reality is the real plan, the real thing, the real purpose and desire that God has. The good things that would come included God dwelling with his people in a very real sense. You see, the limitation here was the sanctuary was God's tent and the people's tents were all scattered throughout the camp. And they were not just scattered in a haphazard manner, in an orderly manner. But God put his tent among the people's tent. But God didn't go and dwell in the tent of the people. He had his own tent among their tents. So that was a shadow. God, the reality is God wants to dwell among his people in a more intimate and closer way. And this is what we're going to see. The picture is an accurate illustration of the reality. Sadly, many today don't understand the picture. And so what ends up happening is they present an alternate reality for people to experience. And what ends up happening is people have a diminished experience, a sub-optimal experience. That's why we're looking at the picture. Your experience needs to match the type, at the very least, it should actually exceed it, because that's the reality. But it should match, at the very least, the type or the picture that's illustrated there, because the picture tells you something about the reality. I want to illustrate it this way. You're familiar with this, but I have two girls, right? And my two girls like to play with dolls. They have their little baby doll, and they feed it and they dress it, and they change it, and it reveals something about the maternal instincts that they have, right? This is an, a type, this is a small picture, an illustration of what one day they will experience should time last, and should they get married and have their own children, and have a real baby that they give real food to. Okay, that's the reality. But the picture gives you an insight about the reality, the greater reality, a shadow, and the reality, important to understand the distinction. And so the good things to come, like we're saying, included the reality of God dwelling with his people in a marked and more intimate manner, God's very presence. And to accomplish this, what was needed was a living tabernacle. And we read about that in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This is God's desire, the reality being closer to fulfillment. This is a very interesting picture here because this verse actually parallels what we just read in Exodus. What was the purpose of the sanctuary? Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now notice here, his name shall be called what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Can you see the parallel? That I may dwell among them, God with us. So who is the sanctuary here? It's Emmanuel. It's Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Now the question maybe might throw you off a little bit because uh, I'm asking it intentionally. Who is the sanctuary? Not what is the sanctuary. The sanctuary, the tabernacle, God's dwelling with man is a person, a living person, the very Son of God. And that name given here by the, the heavenly messenger is to reveal that reality. In other words, what was represented by a tent in the wilderness 
now finds its fulfillment in the very Son of God. And that unique, beautiful name that we don't use enough. Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. What does it mean when it says God with us? You know, I misunderstood that for a long time. And many people misunderstand what it means. They think it means God with us is that Jesus is God and he is with us. But that's not what it means. What it means is God the Father is with us through his Son. There's a difference here. Now someone might say, oh brother, I can see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to do away with the divinity of Christ. You know, nice twist. No, that's not what it means. Jesus is God. He is God with us. That's what it's trying to say. No, it's not. And we're not trying to do away with the divinity of Christ. He is the divine Son of God. But the name Emmanuel indicates that it's God the Father who is with us in His Son or through His Son. How do we know this is talking about the, God the Father? Time and again, Jesus said that, and we're going to read a verse in a minute. But Jesus said that the Father dwelt where? In Him. Jesus said, seeing Him is seeing the Father. The Bible tells us that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. That's Emmanuel. That's God with us. You see, the sanctuary doctrine that is important and vital, and we know that, is not just about a building in heaven. This is the practical reality of it. It's about God dwelling with us. It's not just about God dwelling in heaven. We know that. The problem is here on earth. The barrier was sin. God's presence was cut off. And the purpose of God was to restore that so that God can be with us again through Emmanuel. The sanctuary doctrine and this component of the sanctuary doctrine and sanctuary truth, sadly, is missed by so many people. God's desire is fulfilled in Emmanuel. He is the link. Finally. For the first time in the history of humanity, since the fall of Adam, we have a human being who is the dwelling place of God. Ponder that. 4,000 years, for the first time, here is a human who indeed is God with us. Or maybe I should say, is the means of how God is with us. God's presence his dwelling place was in his son, Emmanuel. You know, we use the name Jesus most frequently, most commonly when we refer to Christ, the son of God, because that's how the New Testament presents it. The name Emmanuel doesn't appear many times in the New Testament. It's only a handful of times. So we don't use it as much. And yet it is so revealing. It is so precious in this particular picture that we're looking at. Now, this reality was made abundantly, abundantly clear in a very marvelous event. And this now brings us to picture number two. Now, the incarnation and Emmanuel is the precursor to the second picture that we're going to look at. Here it is. We're about to look at it right now. Picture number two is the baptism of Christ. So picture one was the sanctuary in the wilderness. Picture number two is the baptism of of Christ. You see, the baptism of Christ serves as the key to give us an insight and detail into the meaning of this wonderful name, Emmanuel, and therefore the reality of the experience that God wants to have for his people through what he sent in his son, through the Savior. Here is a verse that we don't often, uh, often associate with the baptism. John 5:37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. This has become one of my favorite verses. I never really understood what this verse was about. And when I did, I was just blown away. Let's see if uh, you might experience something similar as we delve into this verse just a little bit. There's so much contained in this verse. Now, first of all, this verse is referring to this particular event, the baptism. I want to make that clear and just get it out of the way. Why? Because it's at the baptism of Christ that we see there was a voice and there was a shape 
testifying about the identity of Christ. We look at the story of the baptism in the Gospels, but we don't often look at this verse in this context. What did the Father send upon Christ at the baptism? He sent His Spirit. Now, I find it interesting that the story of the baptism is used many times to try and prove that God is a trinity. Right? They say, well, God the Father is in heaven. Here is Christ on earth. And between heaven and earth, you have God the Holy Spirit. One, two, three, trinity. Very clear, right? Wrong. Not according to Jesus. According to Jesus, who was responsible for the voice? It was the Father. And who was responsible for the shape? It's also His shape. It's one individual person, the Father Himself, who is bearing witness. And He is bearing witness in two very distinct ways. By His voice and by His shape. That's the story of the baptism explained by Jesus, who was there, who was baptized. Not explained by theologians, who were not there. According to Jesus, the Father did two things. There weren't two persons, two different individuals doing, doing two different things. It's the Father. He poured out His Spirit on His Son. And He spoke in a very distinct manner. I want to ask you a few questions here, based on this verse. Did the Father get any angel to speak? The answer is no. The Father Himself spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In like manner, the Father Himself sent that shape. And we'll talk about shape, you know, in the pictures, and you can even see it here in the picture. There's a bit of a shape of a dove in that light descending on Christ, right? Now, I know many pictures uh, will draw a bird or a dove at the baptism. I want to tell you something. There was no bird there flying around, Okay. What was happening was, light and glory was descending from heaven. The light and glory was in the shape of a dove. And the descent of that light and glory was like the descent of a dove. If you go read the Gospel accounts carefully, you will see that clearly. But for, I guess, children or for illustrative purposes, most of the pictures depict or, or draw a, a, a dove, an actual dove flying around there. But hopefully uh, you get the point. God was responsible for both, like we said. Light and glory descended on Christ. Now here's a question. Is the shape the same as the voice? Are you sure about that? You know, it's interesting. When you ask a question and people answer, and then when you ask them, are you sure about that? Or if you ask them, are you sure about that confidently? Or something like, are you sure about that? Half the people kind of start thinking, oh, maybe I'm not so sure. And you don't hear as confident answers anymore. Is the shape the same as the voice? Are you sure? Ah, okay, we have a lot more sure people. That's good. That's, that's much better. Because notice carefully, according to Jesus, they were two things. They were two distinct things. The words were not the same thing as the Spirit. Interesting. The words were not the same thing as the Spirit. The spoken words of God the Father Himself. He spoke words, but that wasn't enough. He also sent His Spirit two things. Can you see the parallel with the sanctuary? Can you see how this unmasks false understandings and wrong teachings when it comes to mingling or mixing up the two, the Word of God with the Spirit of God. You see, like the sanctuary, the presence of God manifested in His Son was in addition to the contents. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Did Jesus have the Word of God in His heart and in His mind? Very likely, He memorized large portions, if not the Scriptures themselves. Large portions of the Scriptures. Let me get it a bit closer to home. Did Jesus have the law of God in his heart and in his mind? He did. And yet at the baptism we see here that God's presence was in addition to what was already there in the heart and mind of Christ. 
And I want to make something clear here because somebody will wonder about that. This was not the first time Jesus received the Spirit of God. He was full of the Spirit. But here, in a public manner, at the commencement of his ministry, God was showing everyone, this is the living temple or the living sanctuary that is the parallel or the fulfillment to the one in the Old Testament. And so God gave a very illustrative picture, an event, where he spoke with his own voice. He sent his own shape upon his son to indicate, this is now the commencement of the ministry of the Savior, whose name is Emmanuel. God with us. It was God the Father who was with us through His Son. Some people will tell you that the Spirit of God is just the words of God. The words that God speaks. Or maybe the words that God spoke at one point and are written in a book. But this is not what we see at the baptism of Christ, is it? Very clearly, it's not what we see. There's a clear distinction between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And I want to note here that the Spirit of God the Father came upon Christ directly from God. We don't see any evidence, we don't read of any, uh, anything in the Scripture about an angel doing anything at the baptism of Christ, do we? The voice, according to Jesus, was the Father's, the shape was the Father's, directly from the Father. The glory and the Spirit of God descended on His Son. Now, when this is pointed out, <coughs> excuse me, some people will say, well, this is an exception. The baptism of Christ is an exception. Now, I, uh, I realize that the baptism of Christ is an exceptional event, but it is not an exception. And when people say an exception, they will say, <clears throat> this is what happened to Christ. It's special. It's unique to Him. It's not really what happens to us. I want to tell you something. According to Jesus, His baptism was actually not an exception. It, it is how all righteousness is fulfilled. Isn't that right? Isn't that what He told John the Baptist? He said, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember when John the Baptist said, look, I shouldn't baptize you. What are you doing? The baptism of Christ fulfills all righteousness. You know what that means? It means the baptism of Christ is related to the new birth experience. It means the baptism of Christ is related to our experience if we want to have anything to do with righteousness. So it's not an exception, far removed, has nothing to do with us. That's how righteousness is fulfilled. I realize some people say it's an exception because it contradicts the theology that they want to promote. The theology of that the Spirit is just the words. This story, this picture clearly disrupts that teaching. That's why it is made an exception, but it is not. Now, I want to put these two pictures side by side. I want you to note any similarity that you see. The tabernacle, God's presence, a pillar of fire or light and glory that fills it. Here is the living tabernacle, and there is light and glory descending from God upon Him. Isn't that interesting? That's the picture. This is God with us. Instead of a sanctuary building in the wilderness, a tent, or later a temple, we now have God's own Son, a living temple, God dwelling with man. In both these pictures, you see the consistent distinction between the words of God and the presence of God. Do you see it? It's very clear. Jesus said when he was on earth in John 14, 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. This is now the identity of the Spirit that Jesus received at the baptism, according to Jesus. He doesn't say, God, the Holy Spirit dwells in me. Who, who did he say dwelt in him? It's the Father. So the Holy Spirit that came upon Christ at the baptism, according to Jesus, is identified as none other than the Father. That's why we're saying God with us means God the Father is with us in the person of his Son. His name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. 
Let me put it to you this way. If it's not the Father who is in the Son, then he cannot be Emmanuel. If it's anyone other than the Father, it cannot be Emmanuel. Look at the type in the sanctuary. So the Holy Spirit is none other than God the Father. And the presence of the Father in his Son was not just words and information, education or details. It was the very glory and presence of God himself that filled the temple of his Son. As it did sometimes in the sanctuary, or many times, not just sometimes, in the sanctuary in the Old Testament. Consistent. Can you see a consistent pattern in these layers, in these pictures? It is very clear. The Jews, the unbelieving Jews, did something very interesting. They killed the living temple, the Son of God, to maintain the temple building. Ponder that because there is a parallel today. The Jews killed the Son of God. They got rid of Christ, the living temple, to keep the temple of stone and that whole system. You know that the same thing is happening today? Some, through false teachings, will remove Christ and still insist that they have God's presence. Isn't that incredible? Think about that, removing Christ, the person of Christ, the living Christ, and still insisting that you have God's presence or God's spirit. How can you have Emmanuel without Emmanuel? Right? Because think about it. The only mechanism of how God is with us is through the one who is named God with us. Correct? If you remove him, you cannot have God with us. Simple. It's not complicated. Emmanuel is the name of a living person. It's not the name of a book. It's not the name of an angel. It is not the name of a doctrine, a teaching, or a message. Emmanuel is the name of a person, a living person. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God. That is the only way that you can have the meaning of the name, God, with us. Isn't it simple? Isn't it clear? It's abundantly clear. Now, Jesus indicated that when he was here on earth with a double seal. Notice what he said to his disciple. This is the first seal. Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying... This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Again, so many things contained in this verse. According to Jesus, where is the New Testament? He says it in the verse right there. The New Testament is in my blood. If you ask most people today, where is the New Testament? They think the New Testament is where? in a book, in a section of the book that is entitled the New Testament. Now, of course, you know, the word testament and the word covenant mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. New Testament or New Covenant, that's what we're talking about. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to mock anything or, or anyone here. I'm not trying to mock the Bible in any way, shape, or form. The book or, or the section of the Bible that is known as the New Testament tells us about the reality of the New Testament. We're reading now from the New Testament about the reality of the experience of the New Testament and what the New Testament really is. The New Testament is actually a person. The New Covenant is a person. Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament by a verse where he's said to be the covenant of the people. That's Christ. And so the blood of the covenant is really none other than the life of of the Son. He is the new covenant, and therefore the new covenant is in his life. He gave the disciples a cup to drink to represent that reality. That's a seal of what God wants to accomplish. So the New Testament, the new covenant, 
is a person. It's Emmanuel. It is not a book. The book tells us about that fact. Can you see the difference? Can you see the distinction? And because he's the new covenant, his life is the active ingredient. And that's why he told the disciples, take this cup and drink its contents. What was the point illustrated here? Christ wanted the disciples to have the new covenant where? Inside them. There is so much in that. The new covenant is a living person. His life is the key ingredient. And now he tells his disciples, drink it. I want that to be within each one of you. God with us. That's beautiful. That is profound. The life of Christ, when we talk about the life, the blood is the life, the New Testament or the New Covenant is in his life. The life of Christ is not independent of the Father. We know that because the life of Christ was filled and infused with the Spirit of God without measure, if you remember. The Bible tells us Christ is the last Adam. He was made a life-giving spirit. You remember the Bible says that. We also know that the Bible says that the Lord is that spirit. We use that verse a lot, right? When it says the Lord is that spirit, it means the Lord is that life. He is the covenant. He is the life of the covenant, the living person. Jesus is that spirit, and the spirit is a person. You know, when people argue the spirit and say, look, you guys are saying the spirit is not a person. You're denying the personhood of Christ. Uh, sorry, the personhood of the spirit. Let me, let me be clear and emphatic right here. The Spirit is a person. Isn't that right? It's the person of Christ. See, the problem is, many people think when you say the Spirit is a person, or try and prove that the Spirit is a person, that that automatically means it's a different person to Christ. No, the Spirit is a person. It's the person of Christ. It's Emmanuel. And the Spirit, brothers and sisters, is not an item or a thing. It's not words and information. It's the living person who gives life. The Lord is that Spirit. And Christ's desire was for that symbol to be within. They were to drink that because He wants His life to be within. Jesus was anticipating here the next picture that we will look at. You see, this was not a reality yet. What was happening here at the Last Supper was not a reality just yet, because Christ had to die for them to receive his life. So he was doing this with them as in anticipation of what would come. The next reality, oh, I'm sorry, the next uh, picture, the next scene or seal, I said there are two seals. The next seal actually happened right after his resurrection. So the last supper is just before his death, right? Now notice this just after his resurrection. John 20 verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. These two events are portraying the same truth. One of them uses blood, represented by juice. One of them uses breath, Jesus breathing on his disciples. They're both referring to the same thing. They're both referring to life. The Holy Spirit that Jesus here breathes on his disciples is equivalent to the blood in the cup. You realize that? It represents the same truth, the same reality. The name of that reality is Emmanuel. The life of the Son. What do you get when you get the life of the Son? You're really getting the Spirit of God which dwelt and, uh, and abode in his son. That picture that we saw at the baptism. So beware of any teaching that reduces the spirit of God from the full glory of what it really is to words or information or things that you can acquire with your own efforts. I want to put these side by side because this is significant. Blood and breath, life, and spirit. It's the same thing. Can you see it? This is a double seal on what the reality and fulfillment of Emmanuel was going to be now in relation 
to the disciples. Both of these things, both these things, these symbols, both of them come directly from Emmanuel. It is his blood and it is his breath. Do you think that's telling us something? Most certainly. To be emphatic and to be clear. They don't come from a book. They don't. It's the blood and it's the breath of Christ. Something from outside the disciples was actually imparted to them. And it is in addition to what they already had. That was all demonstrated at the baptism of Christ. Now this brings us to the final and last picture. The fulfillment of all of this. And we bring it all together in this beautiful picture. Now I hope that you can anticipate what the next picture is. You've been following. I hope you can anticipate the next picture. It's very interesting. It's the fulfillment of what Christ was doing right here. When did, when did all these two things, the, these two seals, when did that become a reality and was fulfilled for the disciples? It was on the day of Pentecost. So if you already thought ahead, and you thought, yeah, the day of Pentecost, well done. That's the fulfillment of the drinking and the breathing. The drinking of the cup and Christ breathing on them. It brings it all together. You see... Jesus gave his very own life, his very own spirit, in a marked manner on the day of Pentecost. He sprinkled them with his life. And that life was going straight into them, indicated by this miraculous visible token of tongues of fire on top of their heads. Christ had indicated that there was going to come a day when they would know that he is in the Father, and they in him, and he in them. That's the day right here. The day of Pentecost. Now, what do you think about the day of Pentecost? This miraculous event that occurred, foreshadowed by the drinking of the cup and Christ breathing on them, like I said. Did the disciples know the Bible? Most certainly. Is there a likelihood that maybe they memorized some parts of the scriptures? Very likely. So what more did they need? Because think about the day of Pentecost. Think of what some teachings are present today and what they say. If the words of the Bible are equivalent to the Spirit of God and the presence of God, and the disciples already had that, then what more did they need? They clearly needed something else in addition to what they had. And that something else came about by a miracle from heaven. The high priest ministering his life, just as he indicated to them he would do when he said, drink this, when he breathed on them. Now Emmanuel is extended to his believers. I hope you're seeing the problem here in what happens when you reduce the glorious spirit of Christ to simply words, information and details. It makes the day of Pentecost actually meaningless. You realize that? Absolutely meaningless. This was a miracle that Jesus performed. And it's not just a miracle for the disciples. It's a miracle for every new believer. That's why it's referred to and known as the new birth. What happens at birth? You receive life. Now, not to get misunderstood and technical here, Obviously, the baby doesn't receive life at birth. It's alive well before it's born. Okay, but that's when that life comes out and is visible. Okay, so just not to get confused here. But it's the miracle of a reception and a transmission of life. That's the point. Where did the tongues of fire come from? From heaven. That was the source. Jesus ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. You see, the tongues of fire on their heads was a physical emblem of what was actually happening within the reception of the life of Christ. It came from Christ, not from them. It wasn't already there. They received something in addition to what they had. Can you see the parallels? Now, I want to be clear also. 
Indeed, there were any angels there on that day, on the day of Pentecost. There is no question about it. But I want you to think about it this way. Were there any angels inside the disciples? Are you sure? I hope that makes it clear. There were angels present on the day of Pentecost. But what was within the disciples? The life of the Son. A double seal indicates that very, very clearly. Someone might say, well, the day of Pentecost is, is another exception. You really need to add a lot of exceptions because they contradict ideas that people want to promote. The Bible says that the Father gives the very life of His Son. The Bible says, Jesus said clearly, as the Father hath sent me, so send I you. Now I want to put this all together. Here are the three pictures side by side. Can you see any similarities? Picture number one, the sanctuary in the wilderness. Picture number two, the baptism of Christ. Picture number three, the day of Pentecost. Do you see any similarity? You know, I never noticed that there was a similarity between those three before. And when you see it, you see it. And you can't unsee it. Let me spell it out in case you don't see it yet. Light and fire indicating the presence of God within the sanctuary. At the baptism, light and glory indicating the spirit and presence of God in His Son. The day of Pentecost, flames of fire indicating what? The same thing. Wow. Not something different. Consistency, layers, patterns of truth. Confirming the same reality, that God's presence is in addition to whatever contents there are. It is His glory. It is His very presence. That's His life. And so the tongues of fire indicate the presence and life of Jesus in His people. Now, when we say Jesus and we say God, I don't want us to be confused. Emmanuel is the name of Christ. God with us. When you receive Emmanuel and the life of Emmanuel, it's not apart from God and it's not separate from God, okay? It's still God with us. That's the means of that. And this is really the third temple. There are people busy trying to build a temple of brick and stone in Jerusalem. The first tabernacle was in the wilderness. The second tabernacle, the living one, was the divine Son of God, seen at the baptism. The third temple is where? The believers indicated clearly on the day of Pentecost. Isn't that amazing? That's absolutely amazing. I find that incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, let's make some applications here as we put this together and draw it to a close. Here is the Bible telling us about the third temple. Ephesians 2, 19-22. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. No comment needed. In light of what we found. Isn't it clear? A growing, living temple of people. Inhabited by God. Built by whom? Built by God. The last verse tells us that. In whom you also are. Build it. The people don't build this temple. The Lord is the builder of the temple. Jesus was prophesied to be the builder of the temple. And what's the purpose? A habitation of God. How? Through the Spirit. Summarize that for me in one word. One word, one word. Thank you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Clear, right? 
That's the Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. You know, sometimes we, we, we ask people this question, what's the name of the Holy Spirit, right? You know what the name of the Holy Spirit is? Emmanuel, because it's Christ. You can say Jesus too, because the Lord is that Spirit. It's impossible for it to be anyone else. Absolutely impossible. Jesus in the flesh, ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. Everybody believes that. Everybody thinks that's the extent of the sanctuary doctrine. But Jesus in the Spirit is ministering in the earthly sanctuary of flesh. This living temple. This third temple. Now you see the distraction of thinking that the third temple is a building that is meant to go up in Jerusalem. The third temple has been around for a long time. The question is, are you in it? Are you part of it, rather? And the barrier of sin is solved in the life of the Son. That's why, through Him, we are brought into union with God. And that's why it cannot, cannot be anyone else other than Jesus, the Spirit. And this is really what the New Testament is all about, brothers and sisters. Here is Paul, the Apostle. He knew this. 2 Corinthians 3.6 says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth what? Life. Who has made a Spirit that gives life? It is Christ, Jesus, Emmanuel. Does Paul here tell us that the letter and the Spirit is the same thing? Or is it different? It's different. The letters, letter or letters, the words are not the same as the spirit. We already saw that in a threefold picture, right? So what makes us ministers? If we are ministers of the New Testament, and we know what that is. In other words, we're ministers of Christ. We're ministers of his life. What makes us ministers of his life? The reception of his life, first and foremost. You cannot minister what you don't have. So to be a minister of the new covenant, you must have the new covenant. Where is the new covenant? In his blood, because he is the covenant. So a minister of the new covenant is one who has received the life of the Son. In other words, we are ministers of a miracle. You realize that? In other words, we minister the truth and the reality of the existence of this miracle and invite people to partake of it. The miracle that Jesus performs, the reception of that life. We're not ministers of letters and words and information. You realize that? If we are ministers of the New Testament. Sadly, there are ministers today who minister to people nothing more than Letters, words, and information. And people are told that's the Spirit. That's a tragedy. That's a serious tragedy. They're not the same thing. Paul understood this. So what do we do with this? Is it another exception? It cannot be another exception. This is a reality. This is the truth. To maintain a crumbling theology, we have to ignore so much scripture. Beware. In light of this, I want to ask you a question, because we have to make this practical. Which ministers do you have? Which ministers do you follow? Which ministers do you heed and listen to? Can you discern a minister of letters and a minister of the Spirit? Important reflection questions. Which one do you have? I know there are many ministers today who pride themselves on their expertise in the letters and in the words and in the information and in the details. And people are led to think that that is how you receive the Spirit. Look at the pictures that the Bible presents to us. Now what I'm sharing here today is not to try and ignore the Bible. We're studying what the Bible says. 
We're just looking at verse upon verse upon verse from the Bible. The Bible is telling us about the existence of this reality, this miracle, this experience, and invites us to believe so we can enter into it. The name of that miracle is Emmanuel. Okay, you're catching on. Some are catching on. That's the spirit. Emmanuel is not the Bible. Emmanuel is the covenant, the living temple, the person of the Son. This is the New Testament. This is the New Testament. And this is what it means to be a New Testament believer, brothers and sisters. Like the Jews, many people today want to build the third temple. Not in Jerusalem, but they want to bring about God's presence by something that they do. Rather than it being a supernatural miracle that God performs. We saw in the Bible, it is God who builds the temple. But many people today want to be the builders of the temple. They desire to accomplish the presence of God by filling the temple with words, information, details. Can you see what I'm saying? It's a serious problem because in so doing, they think that they are filling the temple with God's presence or God's spirit. They think these things are what constitutes God's presence. They are not. We saw the distinction very clearly. Here is our last verse. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is a miracle. This temple is not built by man. This is the work of God because it is the habitation of God. Don't you realize that man cannot build a fit habitation for God? The only time that man was permitted to build a habitation for God was in the type. The symbol, the representation, not the reality. Even when Jesus came, Jesus says in scripture, the prophecy says, a body has thou prepared for me. And the temple, the third temple, the temple of the Lord, his believers are built by God himself. The temple of God. And God says, I will dwell where? In them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Again, you can summarize that in one word. You know it, right? Emmanuel. And so the three pictures that we looked at, these three beautiful pictures, destroy false doctrine and false teaching when it comes to this particular point. In each one we saw God's presence was in addition to the contents. The temple on earth cannot be inhabited by anyone other than the Son, because He's the only priest. That's why the Holy Spirit cannot be anyone other than Emmanuel, Christ, God with us. Emmanuel is the favorite name for, for Jesus in this message, okay? I, th I, hope, I hope you get that, all right? That's the one we're highlighting, because hopefully now you, you see why. You see, the presence of Christ, I, I want to emphasize this, and I'll just take a few extra minutes just to emphasize this, brothers and sisters, because this is significant. Having the presence of God is not about what you can do with the Bible. And yet that's what so many people believe because this is what they are told. And so a lot of people expend a lot of effort and skill at reading and memorizing the Bible. Good things, they're not bad things. But this is not how the presence of Christ is accomplished. It's a miracle that he does, not you. You realize, I hope, that anyone can read and memorize the Bible and not have the presence of Christ. You know that, right? There was a whole segment of the Jewish nation that did just that. They were experts in the Bible, and they did not have 
the presence of Christ. They did not have life. They did not have the spirit. Can you see it? Do you get it? It's very clear how God dwells in his people. The first two pictures are clear. God dwells in his people in exactly the same way that was illustrated time and again. I hope you understand the word better in light of what we looked at today. Can you see how understanding the word feeds your faith? Can you see that? And when your faith is informed, it is intelligent. And therefore, it can be exercised with confidence. And what's the result? It will be seen in your experience. That's, that's what studying the truth of the scripture is meant to do. To inform our faith so we can exercise it confidently. We know it's according to the word. And that will materialize in our experience. We know in which direction we can exercise our faith in now. Sadly, I have heard it said that you cannot really have Christ in you. If you believe that, that's spiritualism. It's dangerous. Let me tell you what's dangerous. It's to deny the reality that the Bible reveals to us time and again. The miracle of Christ in you. That's dangerous to deny that. Now in sharing this, I know, Someone might feel like I'm attacking them. I, I realize that. When you talk about some controversial things like this, uh, some people might feel attacked. Or someone might say, oh, brother, I, I know what you're doing. You're, you're attacking or targeting this particular speaker or this particular preacher. Now, I didn't share any names of anyone with you today. I'm dealing with doctrine and I'm dealing with teaching. If you feel personally attacked by this message, I have something for you to consider. We present it clearly what the Bible says, and it unmasks a dangerous error, a false teaching. The thing is this, if a person is so attached to a teaching that they feel like they are personally attacked, they should really examine the teaching that they are attached to. We're dealing with teaching and doctrine. We're not dealing with people individually or targeting individual people. There is a difference. But I know things get muddy because people hold to certain doctrines and they hold to them so much that when you talk about the doctrine, they feel that you are talking about them personally. So take this as an invitation to examine what doctrine or what teaching you hold to. I realize also that the problem is that this supernatural experience that the Bible talks about is foreign to many people. I want to illustrate that what, uh, what I mean uh, by that. Because people fear what they don't understand, what they can't explain, and what they haven't experienced. People fear that. They fear the miracle. Do you know who else was afraid of miracles? The unbelieving Jews. You remember, they called the miracles of Jesus satanic. They said they were dangerous. They warned people about them as being a deception of Satan. Can you see a parallel? They sought to turn people away from the miracles of Christ. And you know what? These Jews never got to experience the blessing of those miracles. They saw them as dangerous and deceptive. And you know what's interesting? They felt personally attacked when Jesus pointed out their errors. Not much has changed. Now, I say this not to attack anyone. I say this to draw parallels to invite you to really examine what you believe. Our purpose is not to attack each other. Our purpose is to unmask error so we can have the truth and have the faith to have the corresponding experience that God wants for us. Now that your faith is more informed, I wanna ask you a few questions. 
How is your temple today? What's in there? Or who is in there? Is it contents that you put in there? Or is it God's greater presence accomplished by Him? Hopefully these questions make sense now in light of what we covered. Do you have items in your temple? Or do you have the living priest? That's what we're talking about. So I want to invite you to make a choice today. To make Christ Jesus, Emmanuel, the priest of your temple. It's really your choice. Now you have understanding. Now you can exercise your choice. And your choice is your faith. To choose to believe something. To exercise your faith in a particular direction. Sadly, like I said, so many people today are ill-informed, and so they make the wrong choice. They exercise their faith in another direction, hoping for an outcome that they have been promised by someone. Now that you have understanding, you can exercise your faith in the right, in the right direction. How many of you today want to say, yes, I want Jesus. I want Emmanuel to be my comforter and to live his life in the flesh. How many of you want to say that today? You can put your hand up if that is you. Amen? Does it make sense? Is it easier to explain to others now? Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll close together. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.